Ladies and gentlemen, stick around. We've got Ideas by Elliot. Hey, folks, you're listening to Ideas by Elliot. And we're here with Ideas by Elliot. Podcast, podcast, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> This is the Ideas by Elliot podcast, sponsored by Camera Corner Studios, Yikes Salon, Trisha Nell Law, and Release Wire. I'm Elliot Christensen, and normally I spend my time working with clients on their internet projects. Websites, marketing, email, all the stuff they need to get their business found online. This is my chance to take a break and talk in-depth with the most interesting people I know. There are no rules. There's no censor. There are no do-overs. It's raw, unscripted, and never edited. This is episode number 29, a talk in my basement with entrepreneur Michael Taylor. I'm here with Michael Taylor. Yes. Fresh new entrepreneur, and we're going to hear about his business and anything really. Hopefully, maybe some technology stuff. I mean, that's what I'm interested in. Cool. Okay. I'm interested in your business. Technology, I'm surrounded by all the time. So like that, that, right. doesn't, that doesn't do that much for me. Mm-hmm. So tell me about your business. What's it called? It's called 3Mod. We're in Milwaukee or just south of Milwaukee, St. Francis area. It's just been crazy. We started as kind of this 3D development company and we've almost kind of pivoted. And now we've become like a marketing media company. And we've been doing commercials for real estate agents and doing we're kind of we're still 3D based. We do we try to like push 3D de- technology cuz I kind of feel like that's the future. What does that mean? Okay. That's tough. Older people, they just can't really like I have the I don't know, you've seen the goggles, like the VR goggles. They'll put it on, they'll they know what's going on, but they don't really realize. I feel like it's going to be the next big thing. I feel like the internet in 1992. Is that like a good uh I know what I mean when I say that, but I think I would mean something different than what you would mean. Right. Truthfully, like if we're trying to explain this to people Mm -hmm. that are, you know, my age or older, Mm -hmm. 3D stuff. Yeah. You're doing... Virtual reality, complete immersion. And so I have to buy glasses for this? Like what do I have to... So to as a consumer of your product, what do I need to do? All of our stuff is viewable on a phone, tablet, a computer. But we're seeing this trend, especially like with the Oculus and uh, I know Microsoft's making some goggles now. People aren't going to be watching TV in five or 10 years. They're going to be sitting in the recliners at home with these goggles on and they're going to be in the action. They're going to be like looking at like a movie. You're going to be able to say like, there's Bruce Willis. And then you turn around and say, there's like Eddie Murphy, which I don't know what movie that would be. But <laughs> that would be an awesome movie. I would want to see yeah. <laughs> Probably another Die Hard, let's be honest. It's fascinating because you are a little bit younger and Mm -hmm. you have been part of the smartphone revolution, so to speak, right? Okay. 10 years ago, if you had told my parents or maybe even me or you, right, Mm -hmm. that everybody would be sitting with these phones and it would be a problem. It would be to the point that it's a problem that people are looking Mm -hmm. at their phones too much. They would think that we were crazy. Maybe you wouldn't because you're a futurist and, you know, and I I tend to be forward looking too, but. My thing that I think is going to be revolutionary, and you know, I think some of this VR stuff can be very helpful. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a lot more influential in business than it is for consumer products, mm-hmm. at least initially. You know, for the first right. decade, probably. I'm not sure that people will be like laying in their recliners watching Bruce Willis and Eddie Murphy in a movie that way, but I think that there will be business cases for that. Mm-hmm. Hospitals where they're training, or I mean, anything where you're training people. If if you mm-hmm. can have a 3D environment, that's helpful. I think. You know, my pet thing is self-driving cars, and we have them today. Yeah, people, everybody, like literally, almost everybody. There, I have a few people that I think I've convinced, but there are people that are like, "There's no way they're going to be available for purchase in five years." I'm like, "They're available for purchase today." Yeah, you can, <laughs> yeah, you can buy them now. I feel like there's a ton of. Do you remember uh, Newton? Abso- Apple? Absolutely. Like, Great technology, just public wasn't ready for it. And I feel like there's stuff like that today. And I feel like VR is is that, but the internet is a huge tool and that makes VR more understandable to people. And since you can communicate on such a mass scale, I think that's a huge factor. Businesses, companies, and ideas are growing on just this crazy exponential rate that... For the listeners, you made a hand motions so, somewhat like an escalator. Maybe like a dance move. <laughs> You'll probably be seeing that in a few years at the club. <laughs> Our opinions kind of diverged here. Tell me about how this 
works. You said that you deal with real estate agents, for instance. So walk me through. I'm a real estate agent. I I heard about this cool thing. Your dad won't leave me alone, and so I, you know, he's like, "You got to, you got to check this out." And I'm like, "Okay, fine." Or I saw it online, and I'm like, "That's really cool." How do, how do I do that? What's the process for me as a customer? Yeah. So if you're if you're the real estate agent, what I yeah. do is I come into a house that it's a listing. An example would be I went to a house in Traverse City. It was a mom, three kids. Showings are impossible for her to get the house clean. So I go in with my camera. I scan the entire thing take pictures, set it up obviously before. And I put it all online, all in the cloud. People can be sitting in their pajamas and tour this house. She doesn't have to clean it or anything like that and prepare for showings. Okay. Well, see, that's a sale point right there. I don't have to clean my house. I can just shovel the junk from room to room and then you can video it up exactly. and then move on, right? That's amazing. Are you beating back all the customers? I can't even imagine anybody would not want that. Is it super expensive? It's not super expensive. Like, are we talking hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands? Well, I can give you my exact pricing. It's $250 for four first 1,000 square feet. And that includes like staging and everything like that. Additional 1,000 square feet is going to be 150 And then every additional after that is 75 So does that make sense? So for a few hundred bucks, a typical house, right. boom. That's as cheap as uh, hiring a cleaning crew to come in. Exactly. It's crazy. It's revolutionary. And the, like, the coolest thing about it is we started with real estate, and that's what we've been doing. I um, ran into a car guy, asked me to do his uh, tea bucket, his Ford. Okay, very cool. Let's do it. <laughs> did that, made some changes to it, and did some crazy stuff with it. Did some call out points and just some some tracks where you could actually tour the car, which you can just press play. And then we're also talking to the children's hospital, some museums. We did a personal art gallery. Crazy stuff. People are coming. Hey, can you do this? I don't know, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> I think we can. <laughs> the car thing. A few hundred bucks might be a little expensive for somebody selling a car, though, right? Yeah, but if you're selling a $150,000 Porsche, and the fact that somebody can tour it in their pajamas in Texas when it's in California, big deal. No, that is a big deal. Game changer, if you will. (laughs) The technology behind it is cool Mm -hmm. to me, right? Also, I think people that are involved in technology sometimes create technology for technology's sake. Mm -hmm. I like to look at the business case and, and think that through. For instance, like Twitter and Yahoo, they continually sort of struggle. They created these businesses and they don't have a hook. You know, they don't have a a business model. They make billions of dollars, you know, but but like their costs are higher than that. This Mm -hmm. balance of, yeah, it's cool and here's what it costs. Am I able to get customers at that? Do I have to lower my costs? You know, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to me. So are you one of the first ones to be doing this? Yeah, and it's kind of crazy because you see a lot of on the coast, each coast is a ton of technology, VR. Midwest, not so much. So it's kind of tough, especially because we go to like these technology meetings, networking events, and there's really not much. It's been a challenge, but I love the Midwest and I don't think I would ever like move to the coast. Because it's not that popular, you have a, a greater customer base, right? Also, you have, because of the internet, you have demos that you can show that you didn't have to make. You can show somebody, hey, this guy on the East Coast did this, this guy on the West Coast did this. Well, he's not here. I am. So let's do that. It's crazy. It's tough to describe because it's obviously a very visual thing. But just looking at it, it almost, I don't know about you, but it it blows my mind. I'm not sure if you checked one out yet. So I did like the house walkthrough, but there was no commentary. So I, I did see that one. It was very cool. I was what was surprising is I didn't see any people. How does the actual physical process work that there's no people in the picture? Are you asking uh, how would I put people in there? Or why no, no, no. There? Why, like, why aren't there any people? I mean, is this, is this, do you have a robot walking around? What's the deal? I can tell you the exact process. It's a, it's a camera and it's got nine lenses and nine infrared rays or like little things that shoot out infrared rays. And what it does is it spins around and it shoots those rays everywhere, it maps the area of the room, what it sees, and then also spins around again, takes pictures. And this is all, I'm in the other room with my iPad sitting on the couch, usually. And then it maps, so it maps the room and then it goes, applies the pictures as textures to the mapping. So it's also mapping and then taking pictures. Does that make sense? Does it ever screw up? Yes, all the time. 
Have you used Apple Maps? Yep. They have like a flyover mode, mm-hmm. and it makes trees look really stupid. Do you have problems like that ever? We've just been doing interior spaces lately. We haven't really not ventured. trees, but like, is are there like problems where like that where it messes right? up and stuff all the time? And I have to go in and I, I actually edit it all the models that I go on my computer and spend some hours and just kind of hammer out. You know what I mean? No, I don't. Is it like a 3D modeling program that you use? Yep. Like, so you can like move the points? Yep. I can move anything, basically put anything anywhere and cut out stuff that's a lot of times, especially with windows, it'll shoot stuff and then I'll, or mirrors, I'll get reflections and it'll think something's there when it's actually not. So I have to go in, cut all this, keep that. And then uh, a lot of times, especially with stairs, you get different layers and they don't match up. So I just have to go through and just make sure everything's perfect. So you do this all for a flat rate. That's your killer point. I think if you did a video showing you editing this stuff and how much thought and precision goes into all of that, I think that that would be miraculous. You know, maybe this is a Midwest mentality thing too. People are cheapskates. They think they can do everything themselves. Which literally makes no sense at all. They think like, they can YouTube the they, tutorial. Yeah. Yeah. They think they can do everything. Like that'd be like me fixing my car. It'd be idiotic. You know, I'm gonna cost myself more money, literally, because I'll break something. But also, you know, the opportunity costs and everything. So for a few hundred bucks, you are getting rid of the need for a real estate open house mm-hmm. or minimizing those. That should save money. If I'm the if I'm the real estate agent, yeah, I should be eating this up, right? Oh, I just saved myself a full mm-hmm. day. Yeah, time. Time for especially for real estate agents, time is the huge that's well what I'm seeing, I'm obviously not a real estate agent, but from what I talk to and what I see is time is their biggest concern. So they uh, at the end of the day they want a link. They just say go to this place, shoot me the link email. Like I'm thinking like okay, I'm a real estate agent. I could go buy this fancy camera contraption or I right. could cobble together with the, a similar system. Mm-hmm. I'm a cheapskate. I'm a whatever. I want to maximize my revenue, right? But they're not going to know how to edit it and make it look good. I cannot tell you. Well, I can tell you how many hours I've spent. We get everything done 24 hours from the start of the scan till when we get the final product, that URL. I cannot tell you how many times I've spent. I I haven't slept. Red Bull. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Red Bull coffee. Red Bull. Like I like to alternate because it keeps my taste buds, (laughs) (laughs) which is probably super unhealthy. So it is super unhealthy. I do a lot of coffee. I have coffee right here. You got your Coca-Cola right there. Uh, I don't know any Red Bull. That stuff kind of scares me. I got my own Keurig, and I did the I do the K cups, and I got a package of 500, and I have literally I can see the box start to dwindle oh, down. Yeah. So I don't know what stage it becomes a problem, but I think I'm there. <laughs> I think I'm way past it, and it's okay. I'm loving it. <laughs> if you drink that much coffee, you should probably switch. We have a Keurig upstairs. We moved on from the K cups, so we just fill it with coffee. The little thing, right? I like that it's always warm and it's always, you know, the right density, right? Right. I really should just make pots of coffee because I drink that much. Right. You just go <laughs> We were talking about the editing. No, no, no. I no. get off track. I'm like, a, you know, something shiny. Well, like, let's go. And see, then we're a bad influence on each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always tell people that, and because they're, they don't do this for a living, right? So I say, tell me what it is that you want. Don't think you know what things are easy, which things are hard. You tell me what you want it to do. I may have a better idea on how to do that or how to implement it. But also, even if you want something that you think is really hard, that might be really easy. Right. And I always give examples of colors. Like if you want to change the entire website to be blue, that's actually pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even if you want to make it a, a blue color palette, that could be potentially really easy. But if you want to move this one element one pixel over, that might actually be really hard because Mm. there's all these unintended consequences. And I can see a whole bunch of that in what you do. Yes. You know, we're in the basement. I'm looking at my crappy basement windows here and I'm thinking, oh, if I wanted to do some editing on that, Mm -hmm. there's the unintended consequences of the border between there and the basement wall. Mm -hmm. The coloring might seem unnatural. Uh, So what kind of problems do you run into? You know, like the places we've been doing so far, I want it as realistic as possible because we do... Um, we kind of ventured into this idea of insurance. Uh, a lady had a flood. She wanted to scan her house, make sure everything, just in case anything happened, she didn't want so she could use it for insurance. Oh, that's brilliant. So we did that. and But yeah, I haven't been running into a lot of people who want different things that aren't actually there, which has been great because it saves me a ton of time. I guess even you being like a perfectionist, mm-hmm. if you're like, oh, that the window didn't 
photo, you know, whatever you right. want to call a photograph, right? It didn't turn out like perfect. And you want to fix it. Can the fixing cause other problems? Not really. Okay. Basic coding stuff and it's just all time, really what it comes down to. So it's nothing. It can take more time than you think though. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And this is true of anybody who has a job, you mm-hmm. know, anybody who does a job and they do it full time or they, they have experience doing it. If you're good at your job, everybody else thinks it's easy. Mm-hmm. It's only if you're bad at it, I think, that they think it's hard. Mm-hmm. And this can, this can work against you. I've lost clients after a few years because I made everything easy for them. I just took care of everything. And they didn't even know what I was taking care of. So because I didn't send them an itemized invoice and said, well, you know, I spent this many hours doing this and this many hours doing that, mm-hmm. they'd be like, well, I don't even know what it is you do. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's all behind the scenes stuff and they don't see it, so they don't think it exists. I know exactly what you're talking about and it's kind of a, I feel bad because I don't want to like say like, hey, this is, this took me so many hours because obviously like I'm a professional, I do it. But at the same time, it's kind of like, can you like appreciate (laughs) what I'm showing you? You know what I mean? What's your process for handling that discussion? What's your strategy for handling that? Uh, You know, I would like to learn from you. First mistake. <laughs> um, you know, well, my dad helps me a ton with client relations. That's like his main thing. He helps me a ton with uh, bookkeeping client relations. That's his forte. And he's been telling me, especially because I've noticed there's almost a communication difference between business and real life. When you're talking to business clients via email, totally different than when I'm texting my friend uh, Brandon about what he's doing tonight. They don't teach you that in college or in high school. So it's kind of one of those things. I mean, they might, depending on obviously where you go, but they didn't teach me that. So it's- Okay. You know what, though? Whatever. Your dad will get mad at me no matter what. But- <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome to my world. <laughs> I think that it's a combination of young people and technology. Those lines aren't as rigid as they used to be. The line between business and personal has largely evaporated. You know, people are working over at coffee shops. We're recording this in a basement. A fine studio basement. Probably the best studio basement I've seen today. Thank you. (laughs) Top 10 for sure. (laughs) I like pushing the boundaries of some of that stuff a little bit because customers do. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many customers have my my personal cell phone number. 10 years ago, that never would have happened. Like nobody did that. And now it's almost an expectation that if you're a professional doing work, whether you're part of a big company or a small company, you're going to get, you're going to give your personal cell phone number to everybody. Can I ask you a question? Can I, yeah. Do you feel like you're more successful or do you feel like it's more successful in general when someone incorporates their personal life into their business because they are, you know what I mean? It's like a huge passion thing and there should almost be. I do actually think that now. And I think, I think things have changed. It was funny back when I was starting out, we had to pretend almost. I mean, we didn't lie to anybody, but you know, we had to like pretend we were some huge company. Fake it till you make it. Well, a little bit, you know, so like we had an expensive phone system, multiple menu options, and we had automation there. We had 24 hour support. So we would have people, you know, on staff answering calls. And it turned out like most of that stuff didn't matter. And it was probably a big mistake in retrospect, like that money would have been better spent on other resources. And now I would never do that. This may have always been the case for you. This is the way things were supposed to be. And people who are actually successful, they are taking advantage of that personality that, you know, I'm a professional. I have this level of expertise. You can go probably too far on making things personal. If every one of your clients is a Facebook friend, for instance, and you're posting your Saturday night party pictures, maybe that makes them feel uncomfortable. I'm not sure. The other thing is ruthlessly outsourcing. We've entered a time where you really don't ever have to have employees. You can have a massive enterprise with no employees. Right here in Green Bay, we have a giant call center company. You could be a huge company. You could outsource all of your customer support. You could be a huge company and like Apple, outsource all of your manufacturing. Smaller companies, there's tons of options everywhere in between. You pick the thing that you're amazing at and you do that. You go to some underpaid overseas person to do your bookkeeping and marketing for you. Generally, though, like marketing is usually a core competency of, a, of, of most companies. You can sell it better than other people can sell it gen- generally. It's not always the case. The research and development kind of thing. So like improving your product, that's got to be internal. But like everything else can be outsourced now. That wasn't the case 20 years ago. 
everything was different. 20 years ago, if you would have picked up a business call on a cell phone, people would be weirded out by that. Now it's an expectation. The whole the world is completely upside down, like the things that used to be a big deal. No, you're 100%, you're 100% right? It- I don't know where that line is, and I don't know that anybody else does. Excellent points. I think that you have to find that for you, yes. and you have to find mm-hmm. that for your business. Mm-hmm. People always give the example of like a heart surgeon, right? Would you want to go on Facebook and see your heart surgeon getting drunk on a Saturday night? They're people, so they do that just like anybody does. Mm-hmm. I don't want to think that the guy's just a right. robot. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now I'm to the point where I feel like I'm starting over in terms of like my business knowledge, and I question everything. Okay, I made my own logo, but you know I could outsource that, and maybe it'd be just as good. Mm-hmm. And so now I I only do the things that I like doing, or that I actually am really good at. Mm-hmm. That's not very many things. <laughs> I think you bring up an excellent point, though. You're very self aware. I think that's a key, a key trait in just in business. In one sentence, you outdid me. Self aware. I think you're 100 percent right. Find what you're good at. Double down on those skills, and that's essentially. You're going to be, I think you're going to be happier and you're going to be more successful. And I think it's a lot of people don't do that. But you know the traps, right? Like I pointed out my logo. You said, did you design that? And I said, yeah. And I've gotten mixed feedback on that. Mm-hmm. It probably would have been a better move for me to outsource that. But I felt like, well, you know, that's part of my identity. And even if it's bad, like that's, that's, that's who you the are. rough edges and all, right? What I struggle with is going too far one way or the other. I feel like you can outsource too much. Yeah, very true. And then you lose your identity. Mm -hmm. These huge companies that we think make no mistakes, Mm -hmm. uh, they make tons of mistakes. Mm -hmm. What's your idea to keep from falling into these traps? Or am I just losing my mind and paranoid? Probably a little bit of both. I mean, (laughs) as far as the paranoia and losing your mind. But uh, yeah, I think you're 100% right. And I think uh, big companies and I think forever companies are going to make mistakes because it's how they get better. And I don't think you should be scared to make those mistakes. You know what I mean? Because failure is just kind of like, it's how you build your company and how you eventually get to the final thing. I do. That's what makes your company your company. So how do you fall? How do you keep from falling into some of the the traps, the the entrepreneur traps? Obviously, there's some traps that can't be avoided. And if I make a mistake... Like what would some of those be? Marketing is something we're doing like a lot of right now. And the way to market VR, there is no like path. So it's something because it's something that's not really out there yet. There's not really a way to market it. So that's kind of tough because we're experimenting with like obviously a ton of stuff. St- some stuff doesn't get clicked on. Some of it does a ton. It's kind of just like, where is this going to go? Now, where is this going to go? I've been making mistakes. And the craziest thing is because I've made mistakes before. Like I've worked at restaurants. You can always blame someone. This? Nope. <laughs> it's all me making the mistakes. And it's kind of like totally like little learning things. What I've been doing is I've been going to a ton of the uh, networking meetings, talking with just accomplished business people, and they give me a ton of pointers and a ton of, hey, I did this. It might work for you. It might not. Probably worth checking out. And it's been like crazy. Milwaukee, the area in general, has been electric, and people have been helping me out like you wouldn't believe. I think the people listening are interested in hearing about your thought processes and you know, whether they're business people themselves or they're just interested in your story, I think, I, I think we want to get inside your mind and how you're finding success and dealing with failures. Hopefully, you're naive. The problem is, if you go into business too late in life, I think, you have all these things like, oh, I can't do that. You have kids or you have too much at stake. When I was young, I had no fear. I thought I knew everything. The no fear part was good. The thinking I knew everything was bad. I feel way more ignorant than I did at 21. And I probably do know a little more, but I feel like I know less. I felt so much confidence and it was just misplaced. I think it obviously like there's a huge range of pitfalls. I think they're going to be different for any, depending on your company and depending on like if it's a startup. It's kind of crazy just because A lot of these groups I go to, I hear their problems, and I'm having the exact same problems. What would be an example of that? Like a big deal or like a little deal? Doesn't matter. Sometimes little deals are big deals. We've been sitting around in some groups, and there'll be some guys like, I don't have any money this month. Like, I can't can't pay my employees. I don't know what to tell my wife, like stuff like that. And it's kind of like, how do they, how do you come back from that? 
and there's obviously depending on the business there's multiple ways to to do so it's going to be different for everyone so there's kind of no like definitive answer because it's so it's such a broad question and there's so many little answers how would you deal with that so if you had a month where you made no sales how would i personally do i have capital in the in this uh in this in your situation in august you make zero money probably have a a couple of swear words <laughs> get pretty mad and uh reevaluate just uh see where i'm at and see what i did wrong and try to combat those areas maybe pivot the company and uh maybe take a different approach to things and try to put myself in some different shoes than the ones i'm in i think most entrepreneurs would have just stopped at the swear word part Mm-hmm. They become an entrepreneur. They become a small business owner. To me, there's a few reasons. Number one is usually they can't get a job working for anybody else. <laughs> if we're honest, yeah, yeah. most entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. that is the case. Mm-hmm. Number two, they do actually have a really good idea. Now, sometimes that's an idea for idea's sake, but they have good ideas. These people mm-hmm. who have a hard time working for other people, mm-hmm. they have a good idea. It's not logical. Right. Being an entrepreneur very rarely is the logical move. Right. You're almost always going to make more money doing something else. You're doing it for ultimately emotional reasons, self-satisfaction, pride, all these emotional reasons. I was actually being serious when I said that most entrepreneurs would stop at the swear word part. They're not able to be self-aware, evaluate how to handle things going forward. How are you able to do that? Why are you a Superman and I'm a confrontational asshole? That's really an excellent point you bring up because I think the a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs and they love the idea of not. It's like there's this thing out there. It's like a fad right now that you don't have to work nine to five. You can work whenever. But everybody's got ideas. You talk to people in the street, they'll have an idea for a company that's maybe good, maybe not. But I think what separates the really good people from the really bad people. Well, not not exactly good people from you know what I mean. The successful from the not successful is the amount of work. And I do. And you brought up before. I have a great advantage because my body can take the fact that I can not sleep for two, three days. Sometimes, sometimes four, <laughs> sometimes five, <laughs> and I can stay up and just crank out work. And I think that's a huge advantage as an entrepreneur. The fact that I can stay up and just content, content, and just build um just build the the company. It's just huge. So you have this intensity now because it's still relatively new. A year from now, two years from now, that actually brings up a bunch of questions. How long are you planning on doing this? Honestly, I want to do this as my full-time job. I have a year left of college and it's mostly easy classes. So I think I can balance everything. I think in 90 days, I don't want to say anything, but in 90 days from now, I think you're going to be impressed. Oh, I'm already impressed. Then I'm done. I'm done. All right. End it. Let's go. <laughs> the entire business was to impress me. I'm already impressed. When mm-hmm. I first went into business, I wanted to build websites. Problem was that businesses didn't even have internet access back then. So in order to even be in the website game... Just for the record, when was... <laughs> 95, 96, 97. I went from being you. I went from being the young guy in the room to all of a sudden, I'm the old guy in the room. I don't know when that happened. Like most things in business and in life, uh, it happens slowly. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, well, now I am the old guy. That's weird and interesting. So our barrier was very obvious. We're not going to sell anybody a website if they don't have internet access. Like that just is rare. It's not going to happen. And then it hit a point where, okay, everybody had internet access. And then that became an impediment. The fact that we were providing this service, it became an impediment to our, our core business. It's hard to know how to say no because it was that was a profitable part of the business. Building websites is more like what you do where maybe we'll have 10 in a month and then the next month we'll have one mm-hmm. or whatever, right? So it's hard to guarantee that revenue stream. I think we fell into some traps there by trying to do too many things, but yet we sort of had to. Going back to not keeping customers in the dark, but we just take care of it. You Mm -hmm. come to us, you're having a problem with internet. We're the ones you call, period. Right. Not enough people value that, I think. 
and you don't know that going into it. Mm -hmm. This is where I think you have an advantage by not having gone through some of those things and not having the tendency to say no. You're willing to say, let's try. Right. So tied into that revenue question. So I said, okay, in August you make no sales. Then you reevaluate and you're like, well, maybe I should add this to my product Mm -hmm. offering. Pivot, you said. Mm -hmm. How will you make that determination? That's a very a, a very tough question. And right? it's like a yep. hypothetical of a hypothetical. I view some parallels between your business and my business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. How will you avoid the pitfalls that maybe that I fell into? Well, I think it's kind of interesting in the in the vocab way that you call them pitfalls because I would never think of. So they're pitfalls in retrospect. Oh, okay. I I get what you mean. Yeah. Looking back, looking back, it's much easier to make decisions. <laughs> right. We built up massive amounts of debt. Once you, you get into certain debt situations, you just can't recover. You have entrepreneurism in your family. I don't even know if that's a word. It is now, yeah. We just made that word on this podcast, which is cool. I, like, I, I love you brought up the point of just, I've, my parents own restaurants. We would go in at 4.30 in the morning, and we'd leave at 2 when bar closed. Like, me and my dad, we'd, this is like the hours... Especially starting out, there's not like, we're trying to obviously minimize hours for people. And then there's not people that can do, because you have to, the cooking has to be the exact same every time. So it's kind of, it gave me a definite appreciation and an understanding about what it's going to take to hopefully accomplish my goals. And I think, yeah, that's an excellent point. I feel like I've read a fair number of business books. So there's one called the E-Myth. Are you familiar with that one? Uh, who wrote it? Is it, it wasn't Gary, was it? Gary Vaynerchuk? No. <laughs> no, but he's excellent too. He's a he's a cool dude. At least his first book was was really good. Was that crushing it? Crushing I like that it, one. Yep. Crushing yep. it was great. I listened to that on the treadmill. Really? Yeah, I, I love Gary. I, very inspirational. Very very real too, which is what I like about him. Yeah, but uh, the E Myth is about recognizing that there's three people. Every entrepreneur is either three people, literally, like every company has three types of people that are that get involved, or one person has all three of these traits to varying degrees, right? So there's the, and I, I'm going to get the, the 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 names wrong, but here's the ideas, right? So there's the the technician, that's someone who becomes an entrepreneur who worked at another place and said, I can do it better, and they're the ones that want to do the work. They think that the technology for technology's sake, so to speak, the technician. There's the entrepreneur who has the lofty ideas and the vision and can see around corners and see the future, that kind of person. And then there's the process person. I think you have these other two areas nailed, but how do you deal with like the process part? So when you, can you uh, define process better? Is it more... The restaurant made me think of that. Food has to be the same every time. Exactly. So how do you make your food, your product? So you're almost talking about not only that, but like an identity of a company. Both. Essentially, right? From bottom to top, top to bottom. So there's like the branding idea of how do you how do you consistently do things? But then there's also the efficiency money part. How do you do things mm-hmm. efficiently and systematically from a profitability standpoint too? I think we've jumped on so many tangents in this conversation that I'm trying to like keep up and like I'm also thinking of a, like a thousand other things. I think we're bad influences on each other because you're an entrepreneur and I like I love that and yeah. I, I I try to make those leaps with people. Yeah. No, it's awesome. Yeah, I love talking to people who do the same thing because we could start talking about industrial business and we could end up talking about the Browns. <laughs> Bill Gates referred to that as high bandwidth. People can have a high bandwidth conversation. You're talking about multiple things mm-hmm. all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Most people can't handle that. It's bad if you're trying to have a podcast where you want people to listen. <laughs> I fall in the trap of doing the uh, the multiple conversations at the same time, and you'll. I don't know if you if you can do that, but it's just like like sometimes. The problem is you're not giving enough attention to any of the conversations, then. any of the points. Mm-hmm. You may think you are, but you're not. That becomes difficult. Mm-hmm. I have changed my tune on that a lot. I used to refer to people as slow talkers as a derogatory term and that's actually a good thing because you're you're listening more i suck at that i talk too much and i don't i don't listen enough no uh, i think there's people who talk or there's people who listen with the intent of talking and there's people who listen to actually listen and i don't think there's a lot of people who listen to actually listen i'm trying and because you're self-aware and you actually said that out loud i think you are too it's easy to fail 
And I fail all the mm-hmm. time at that. As we record this, it's July 2016. So what's your 12-month plan? My 12-month plan is I'd like to, as I said, we're a media company. And what I'd like to do is hire some individuals and kind of become a larger media company in dealing with, I'd like to deal with like hospitals, museums, and design their visual effects, but also do so with a way that really drives 3D using cutting edge technology and integrating it into everyday life. And I'd love to do that on a mass scale in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin. Give me a, an example of what that integration would look like. Say you go to a museum, instead of a screen that would display, how cool would it be a 3D hologram pops up and that's your tour. Insane stuff like that. Like it's kind of, it's far out right now and some of it's happening, but to see that in the Midwest and not only be able, and then be able to do that, I just think it would be insane. And that's like kind of my dream, which is kind of... The museum's an easy example, but I guess the part that I was grappling with is the everyday life. So how would you integrate this into an everyday life situation? Like you even mentioned hospitals, and I'm having a hard time understanding what that means. A uh, route that we've been talking about in the VR world, and just not like me, just in general, is this idea, you know, the goggles, like the Oculus. Giving that to um, sick kids and they'd be able to go places and see the world from their hospital bed, like, that's crazy. So it's a completely consumer level thing as an entertainment sort of device. Essentially, yes, but that, I guess it's just kind of a, a very, like, a fine example. It might have been a little too fine, sorry. It's just the, kind of like one of those ideas that just glanced, like, I don't want to take a head. tour of a hospital. When I think about what you're doing now, apply to a hospital, I, you know, making that leap. But you're saying you're in the hospital and you want to be somewhere else. Well, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't want, want to just be 3D scans. Like, that's cool. And I, that's kind of like the, the meat and potatoes of what we're doing right now. But I, lo- I like to, I'd like to venture just to 3D in general. Why? Just the technology okay. aspect Why? is where I want to be. Why is it the future? Why is this so clear to you? Because it's the future. It's kind of just one of those things that, I don't want to say a hunch because it's really not a hunch. It's one of those things that I just have a really good feeling. And when I show people some of the 3D stuff I'm doing, the look on their face, it blows their mind. I have to, I have to tape people's socks on because they get blown off so much. That's kind of, the, that's kind of my, my number one business. Did you make that up yourself? What's that? Th- that little phrase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because that's pretty good. That's gold. You, like that? you better put that into your book. All right. <laughs> okay. So you said you have about a year left in school? A year left, yep. You think you're going to like migrate right into doing this? Yeah. I mean, I hope to, as I'm in school, I hope to almost use uh, what I'm doing in school as a kind of a pool because I have a ton of friends that are in computer science and a ton of just really successful people. And I don't think I'm going to have, I shouldn't say I don't think I'm going to have that around. I sh- I don't think a lot of people have that asset of having such a large pool of people that I can really talk to computer science people. I can talk to marketing people. I can talk to about 100 different people in a day, which is pretty big. And so to be able to talk to all of them, get their feedback and potentially integrate what they're doing or them personally into my business, I think is... What's your major? Graphic design. When I was in school... I took no art classes because I said, well, that's stupid. Oh, no. That's stupid. I'm never going to use that. Right. And, you know, what do I do now? You know, like, I, like, that's the thing that I, so I always have this, like, chip on my shoulder. Like, I feel like I'm un, an underachiever artistically mm-hmm. because, like, I, like, why didn't I do that when I, you know, when I had the chance? How did you know to go into graphic design? How do you feel like that's going to help you here? Why did you bother going to college? Well, just the path in general. It was what it, it was. It's like what I'm most passionate about. I looked at doing like a, number of things and I really wasn't sure and it kind of just came down to what I really like enjoy because I feel like if you enjoy something it's so much more fun it's going to make college 10 times more and I really wanted to go into business because there's obviously like a ton of kind of business savvy and there's kind of like a ton of stuff and that's where you want to make money I just really enjoy like sketching and stuff like that and just design at its most basic form and then design also to what I'm doing and I think I can integrate design and integrate the creative process in a business way that a lot of people don't or can't. And I think that's also a large like asset. I feel like a lot of people I meet, they're either very creative or very business-like. And to be able to have the combination of both. I think so. I'm still trying to get there. 
Yeah, it's, I mean... If you put on seminars, I guess I'd like to go. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but... <laughs> I think you, I, I can see you being very good at that. Why did you go, why did you go to college instead of just doing this? Well, I went to college for multiple reasons, and it wasn't like the only path, but it was the path I wanted. You know what I mean? That I knew I knew there was multiple paths like I could go on that would ultimately be successful, or I think would be successful, ideally. But I really, um, I think college is an excellent time to not only explore school, but to explore different life like opportunities, and you meet a lot of people at college, which I would never in a million years run into, especially in my like personal life. Like I've met one of my best friends is a pastor and I'm not like a religious person or anything like that, but I would never, and we're like best friends. So it's, it's been crazy, but yeah, I think a lot of people go to college with this mindset that it's all about school because it's college because it's a school, which is, (laughs) you can see that, but it's so much more that I don't think a lot of people realize so for me, for me to miss out on that whole element of life and living, I think would be a huge mistake. So that's why I went to college. That's a very enlightened answer. Sorry. I just, I feel like I just dropped a bomb. <laughs> no, not at all. Because that's what I got out of it. Awesome. I can list maybe a half dozen educational things that I benefited. Mm-hmm. And they're small. Uh, the friends that I have, mm-hmm. that was everything. Mm-hmm all the way through from there everything really followed the people more than, mm-hmm. and it defines your whole life at some point you build those contacts and it's just it's more than a contact it's a, you know what i mean it really does it's crazy there was a point i was going to hit on before and uh i think you might think it's kind of interesting there's this uh this n- like this netflix thing that uh i don't know it's like a large trend i see in college and what it is it's people that don't have anything to do instead of doing anything constructive with their time watch like a thousand shows on netflix and it kind of like irks me in a way because all my roommates do it like they just sit there and they just watch netflix all day every day yeah and it kind of like it's kind of one of those like pet peeves where i like i'm like hey you guys gotta like you should do something like go on ebay or something like buy some stuff and sell it or do something productive or like make something I just feel like it's this huge thing right now and a ton of people are doing it. I do it all the time. I'm Well, not all the time, not that much, but I find myself doing it sometimes. And it's kind of a, I think it's going to be more and more people falling into like this trap of watching just a ton of TV. We've hit this point where outside of entrepreneurs who, you know, want to use every last bit of energy that they have, people don't even, they don't need to work 40 hours anymore. That's this artificial number. Uh, you look at people who have like 40 hour work weeks. I mean, there's literally a book called The Four Hour Work Week. That might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but they're not working more than half the time. You know, they're not. And so these people, they don't feel the passion and inspiration that you might feel. Yeah. Well, yeah, like I'm not saying it's a horrible like thing in general. I go up and down and I feel it sometimes. You know, maybe I'll watch Netflix for two days straight. Mm-hmm. That's not the norm. When I do it, and maybe maybe that is just me, but it's because I'm feeling like I'm feeling too much pressure. Now, when I was in college, I felt inspired all the time. Right. Maybe it's generational. Mm-hmm. I have Max, he's 12. He watches a lot of YouTube, but he also creates a lot of YouTube. Right. Whether he's any good at it or if he's just as bad as I am, I don't know. He's trying and he's creating. And... I think creating is so much more rewarding. So we have all these things kind of come into a point, right? So I feel like people need to, they don't need to work as much to accomplish as much. And that affects them psychologically too, because they feel like, oh boy, you know, how important am I in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the easy access. We're almost to the point where you can watch whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you are. And that kind of messes with you. You really made me think with that question. It's so like there are people in my family that are older, older than me. They watch, you know, they have cable TV for the most part, but like it's on all the time. Really? It'll be on in multiple rooms in the house. And I think it affects different people differently. I think that some of the generation deal with it the same way. They're like, oh, I'm just going to kick back and watch TV. Or whether that's Netflix or, or the cooking channel, that's all kind of the same to me. Those are just means to an end. And it's just noise. I worry like we're uh, like that could be 
a bad thing. You know, but then I think like the masses, most people are not entrepreneurs. So like maybe that's okay. Yeah, especially like with the internet that's creating content. If you're just creating something, I think it's it's a big deal. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, but it says a lot about you. Different generations deal with the free time or spare time in different ways. I think it's an interesting uh, disadvantage of technology. I think we talked about advantages of technology for the past uh, hour or so. And this is the first time that it, there are disadvantages. And it's going to be, and I, but I think with time, I think, uh, I think we're going to solve them. What do you define as success for an entrepreneur? Because I think it's different for, so, like, for every entrepreneur out there. You almost have to define it as what they define it as, right? Exactly. In the 90s, when I was young, I was delusional and probably thought that Same. I was going <laughs> to, uh, you know, captain of industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized, you know, it's, it is okay to just be me and let people know who I am, you know, warts and all, and be sort of self-fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Sort of a cop-out. No, I, I, I understand 100% what you mean. You know, I could probably go work somewhere and make good money, mm -hmm. right? Whatever that is. I don't even know what good money is anymore. En enough to live on com like comfortably, essentially. If I got a job working almost anywhere else, I would certainly make more money than I do right now. Mm -hmm. But that's not what it's ever been about to me. But I thought it was. I mm -hmm. thought there was like this big payoff, this big money bag at the end of the rainbow. And there wasn't. And that's totally okay. The journey, like being able to do that and meet all the, the great people that, that I worked with, it's been great and it can, like, continues to be great. It turns out that was what was important to me. It's really interesting because I have this viewpoint of entrepreneurship. And it's not like the golden money bag, but I guess uh, I think a lot of younger entrepreneurs have this Uber. There's this huge Uber like, hey, I want to be like Uber. Every, but everything I listen to is Uber this, Uber that, like whatever. Uber is an excellent ex example of something you can't be as an entrepreneur. Because it's such a big, complex system, you need venture capital. So you can't just go start that. No, yeah. And so if you're the Uber of anything, if you're comparing yourself to Uber, you can't do that as a solo entrepreneur or just a, a group of people getting together and starting a business. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know what? One thing that I, that I didn't ask you is when did this moment of inspiration hit? I have two answers. Well, my first answer is I had to get a summer job. and. I applied at Qdoba. They didn't hire me. Had to come up with something else. That's my first answer. And my second answer is um, I've been doing stuff in graphic design. I've been playing around with 3D stuff. And Uncle's in real estate, huge uh, business guy, tons of knowledge. I got together with him, add my dad in the equation. We just threw around ideas, came up with this 3D scanning kind of mindset and just went with it. They kind of believed in me. and Really more true than maybe you're even thinking it is because what really works for a business is seeing like the need, not just seeing, oh, I can do this cool thing and try to convince people to buy it. So having that contact that is like a potential customer, that's everything. That's super huge because he can explain to you right. what are the important points that you need to yeah. talk to people about, sell them on. Yep. Just a hu huge asset, just as far as like the real estate community in general, how people communicate, what they like, what they don't like, what they need, how important time is. It's crazy. Like stuff I've never, I n I've never known. This is this. Okay. I think for uh, the real estate aspect of your business, I think that that could be the whole business. Yeah. How many homes are there? The market is basically unlimited. E yeah, There's, I agree. You're going to have to tell me how I can invest. A lot. <laughs> One thing that I always try to make sure to ask everyone is if they come back and they guest host with me, who they would like to be sitting there and interview. There's a lot of people. Have you ever had Brian Dancinger on the show? That would be a good show. I don't know if I'd be worthy. I'd feel like, have you seen Wayne's World? Like, that we're not worthy? Cool. Okay. How would you like people to get in touch with you? Over any, any social media works. Also, my website, 3-mod.com. If you, if you type in 3Mod on Google, it will come up. So again, 3-Mod.com, 3-Mod on Facebook. Let's call it a done deal, right? Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Don't forget to run over to iTunes and Stitcher and give a rating and review of the show. It helps other people find us. Cheers.